News of the Times. History News Short. Sony Bean and his cannibalistic family. Estimated killings, 1,000 plus. Estimated time frame, around 1580s for roughly 25 years. The story of cannibal Sawney Bean and his murderous family is a famous one. Information regarding this case comes from the Newgate Calendar, which began publishing in 1782. In essence, the saga of Sawney Bean and his family tell the tale of a family living in a cave outside of Galloway, Scotland, during the reign of James VI of Scotland. They did not interact with others and kept themselves to themselves. Sawney and wife eventually had quite an extensive family of eight sons, six daughters, 18 grandsons and 14 granddaughters and made their living robbing and murdering. According to the story, anyone they murdered was then brought back to their cave dismembered and eaten. The vast numbers of missing people and the corresponding scouting around for guilty parties and their subsequent innocent executions created a real impact on the area so that no one would run an inn in the area in case they would be accused and travellers were fearful to ride through the area. The case became so infamous that the king himself in person became involved. The recounting of the story of Sawney Bean, his family and their eventual capture is retold from the Newgate calendar. The following account, although as well attested as any historical fact can be, is almost incredible. For the monstrous and paralleled barbarities that it relates, there being nothing that we have ever heard of with the same degree of certainty that may be compared with it or that shows how far a brutal temper untamed by education may carry a man in such glaring and horrible colours. Sawney Bean Sawney Bean was born in the county of East Lothian, about eight or nine miles eastward of the city of Edinburgh, sometime in the reign of Queen Elizabeth. Whilst King James VI of Scotland was King of Scotland, Sawney's parents worked at hedging and ditching for their livelihood and brought up their son to the same occupation. He got his daily bread in his youth by these means, but being very much prone to idleness and not caring for being confined to an honest employment, he left his father and mother and ran away into the desert part of the country, taking with him a woman as viciously inclined as himself. These two, Sawney and his wife, took up their habitation in a cave by the seaside on the shore of the county of Galloway, where they lived upwards of twenty-five years without going into any city, town or village. In this time they had a great number of children and grandchildren, whom they brought up after their own manner, without any notions of humanity or civil society. They never kept any company, but amongst themselves, and supported themselves wholly by robbing, being moreover so very cruel that they never robbed anyone who they did not murder. Robbery, murder, and cannibalism. By this bloody method, and their living so retiredly from the world, they continued such a long time undiscovered, there being nobody able to guess how the people were lost that went by the place when they lived. As soon as they had robbed and murdered any man, woman or child, they used to carry off all the carcasses to the den, where, cutting it into quarters, they would pickle the mangled limbs and afterwards eat it, this being their only sustenance. 
and notwithstanding they were at last so numerous, they commonly had superfluity of this abdominable food, so that in the night time they frequently threw legs and arms of the unhappy wretches they had murdered into the sea at a great distance from their bloody habitation. The limbs were often cast up by the tide in several parts of the country, to the astonishment and terror of all the beholders and others who heard of it. Persons who had gone about their lawful occasions fell so often into their hands that it caused a general outcry in the country round. No man knowing what was to become of his friends or relations if they were once seen by these merciless cannibals. Missing people and innocents hung. All the people in the adjacent parts were at last alarmed at such a common loss of their neighbours and acquaintances, for there was no travelling in safety near the den of these wretches. This occasioned the sending frequent spies into the parts, many of whom never returned again, and those who did, after the strictest search and inquiry, could not find how these melancholy matters happened. Several honest travellers were taken up on suspicion and wrongfully hanged upon bare circumstances. Several innocent innkeepers were executed for no other reasons than that persons who had been thus lost were known to have lain at their houses, which occasioned a suspicion of their being murdered by them and their bodies privately buried in obscure places to prevent discovery. Thus, an ill-placed justice was executed with the greatest severity imaginable in order to prevent these frequent atrocious deeds, so that not a few innkeepers who lived on the western roads of Scotland left off their business for fear of being made examples and followed other employments. This, on the other hand, a occasioned many great inconveniences to travellers who were now in great distress for accommodation for themselves and their horses when they were disposed to refresh themselves and their horses or put up for lodging at night. In a word, the whole country was almost depopulated. Still, the king's subjects were missing as much as before, so that it was the admiration of the whole kingdom how such villains could be carried on and the perpetrators not discovered. A great many had been executed, and not one of them all made any confession at the gallows, but stood to it at the last that they were perfectly innocent of the crimes for which they suffered. When the magistrates found all was in vain, they left off these rigorous proceedings and trusted wholly to providence for the bringing to light the authors of these unparalleled barbarities when it should be seen proper to the divine wisdom. Sawney Bean's family Sawney's family was at last grown very large, and every branch of it, as soon as able, assisted in perpetrating their wicked deeds, which they still followed with impunity. Sometimes they would attack four, five, or six footmen together, but never more than two if they were on horseback. They were, moreover, so careful that no one whom they set upon should escape, that an ambuscade was placed on every side to secure them, let them fly which they would, providing it should ever so happen that one or more got away from the first assailants, how was it possible that they should be detected when not one that saw them ever saw anybody else after? The place where they inhabited was quite solitary and lonesome, and when the tide came up the water went for near two hundred yards into their subterraneous 
habitation, which reached almost a mile underground, so that when people who had been sent armed to search all the places about had passed by the mouth of their cave, they had never taken any notice of it, not supposing that anything human would reside in such a place of perpetual horror and darkness. Estimated 1,000 deaths. The number of the people these savages destroyed was never exactly known, but it was generally computed that in the 25 years they continued their butcheries, they had washed their hands in the blood of a thousand, at least men, women and children. The manner of how they were at last discovered was as followed. Sawney Bean and his family discovered. A man and his wife behind him on the same horse, coming one evening home from a fair, and falling into the ambuscade of these merciless wretches, they fell upon them in a most furious manner. The man, to save himself as well as he could, fought very bravely against them, with sword and pistol riding some of them down. By main force of his horse in the conflict, the poor woman fell from behind him and was instantly murdered before her husband's face, for the female cannibals cut her throat and fell to sucking her blood with as great a gusto as if it had been wine. This done, they ripped up her belly and pulled out all her entrails. Such a dreadful spectacle made the man make the more obstinate resistance, as expecting the same fate if he fell into their hands. It pleased Providence, whilst he was engaged, that twenty or thirty from the same fair came together in a body, upon which Sawney Bean and his bloodthirsty clan withdrew, and made the best of their way through a thick wood to their den. The man who had the first that had been fallen in their way and came off alive told the whole company what had happened and showed them the horrid spectacle of his wife, whom the murderers had dragged to some distance, but had not time to carry her entirely off. They were all struck with stupefaction and amazement at what he related took him with them to Glasgow and told the affair to the provost of that city who were immediately sent to the king concerning it. The involvement of King James VI of Scotland in about three or four days after, His Majesty himself in person with a body of about 400 men set out for the place where this dismal tragedy was acted in order to search all the rocks and thickets that, if possible, they might apprehend this hellish crew which had been so long pernicious to all the western parts of the kingdom. The man who had been attacked was the guide, and care was taken to have a large number of bloodhounds with them, that no human means might be wanting towards their putting an entire end to these cruelties. No sign of any habitation was to be found for a long time, and even when they came to the wretch's cave, they took no notice of it, but were going to pursue the search along the seashore when the tide was out. But some of the bloodhounds luckily entered the den and instantly set up a most hideous barking, howling and yelping so that the king with his attendants came back and looked into it. They could not tell how to conceive that anything human could be concealed in a place where they saw nothing but darkness. Nevertheless, as the bloodhounds increased their noise, they went farther in and refused to come back again. They began to imagine there was some reason more than ordinary. Torches were now immediately sent for, and a great many men ventured in through the most intricate turnings and windings 
till at last they arrived at that private recess from all the world, which was the habitation of these monsters. Now the whole body, or as many of them as could, went in and were all so shocked at what they beheld that they were almost ready to sink into the earth. Legs, arms, thighs, hands and feet of men, women and children were hung up in rows like dried beef. A great many limbs lay in pickle and a great mass of money, both gold and silver, with watches, rings, swords, pistols and a large quantity of clothes, both linen and woollen, and an infinite number of other things which had been taken from the whom they had murdered, were now thrown together in heaps or hung up against the sides of the den. Sawney's family at this time beside him consisted of his wife, eight sons, six daughters, eighteen grandsons, and fourteen granddaughters, who were all begotten in incest. These were all seized and pinioned by his majesty's order in the first place. Then they took what human flesh they found and buried it in the sands afterwards, loading themselves with the spoils which they found. They returned to Edinburgh with their prisoners, all the country, as they passed along, flocking to see this cursed tribe. The Execution when they were come to their journey's end, the wretches were all committed to the toll-booth, from whence they were the next day conducted under a strong guard to Leith, where they were all executed without any process, it being thought needless to try creatures who were even professed enemies to mankind. The men had their privy members cut off and thrown into the fire, their hands and legs were severed from their bodies, by which amputations they bled to death in some hours. The wife, daughters and grandchildren, having been made spectators of this first just punishment inflicted on the men, were afterwards burnt to death in three several fires. They all, in general, died without the least signs of repentance but continued to the very last upon gasp of life, cursing and venting the most dreadful imprecations upon all around and upon all those who were instrumental in bringing them to such a well-merited punishment. That concludes this News of the Times episode of Sawney Bean and his cannibalistic family. We really hope you enjoyed the show. If you did enjoy the show, please subscribe and tell your friends. Subscribing really helps us. We are aiming for 1,000 subscribers. There's no cost to you, and it really helps to support us. Just tap on the subscribe button that pops up if you haven't already subscribed. We upload longer Regency or Victorian crime stories three times a week, with shorter Victorian stories on other days to give a flavour of the times. For our podcast listeners, you can see this podcast with the associated pictures on our YouTube channel at News of the Times. You can find the link in the show notes. Thank you again for watching and listening. This has been News of the Times, and I am Robin Coles. <laughs>